This is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I start with a comically oversized slab of black walnut that might be the prettiest piece of wood I've ever worked with. Oh, and I even try a new finish. Stay tuned. If you're a regular to my channel at all, you know just how fortunate I am to live where I live, because I have access to some of the most beautiful wood found anywhere in the world, and even compared to everything I've got before, this slab is incredible. You'll notice if you look closely, it says art slab. You'll also notice that I am not art. And this slab belonged to Art, who is technically the owner of Gobi Walnut, although you've probably seen his son, Aaron, who manages it here on my channel before. Anyway, Art had stashed this because it was this incredibly figured, incredibly beautiful slab of Bastone Walnut, which is like the most rare walnut you can even find. Aaron came to me and said, hey, I gotta clear out the warehouse. I'm sick of my dad stashing this stuff. Do you want this? And I don't care if it's baseball cards or mattresses. If the owner is stashing something, I want it because you know it's gonna be the best since they have access to so many different slabs. So I jumped on the opportunity to buy this one. I know some of you are already furiously typing out your angry comments about who would cut up such an amazing slab. And unfortunately, my client was not able to fit a 65 inch wide desk and it's already really big. This is like 80 some inches by like 36 inches at this point. So this is gonna have to do for his relatively small home office. And then I know what you're gonna say next is why don't you save this for a bigger project? I can't believe you would do that. And this client wanted the best. They wanted a Bastone Walnut slab and this was an incredible slab. And I saw this movie once where a guy was afraid of heights and the woman asked him, why do you get the penthouse if you're afraid of heights? And he said, because they don't put the penthouse on the ground floor. And can't remember the name of that movie. I think it was The Expendables or something, but that's kind of how I feel is if you want the best, you gotta use the best. After I got that crack cleaned up, I took it into Creative Woodworking to have it just skip planed, not going too far with it, but just enough that you can really start to see that color, that grain, and that figure. And the reason for this was I needed a good flat surface so I could properly fill that crack. If you've seen any of my videos before, you're gonna be shocked to find out that I'm actually gonna fill that crack with black epoxy. And as I've mentioned before, that black dye is horrible at staining wood, so I need to seal it first. And how I seal my slabs these days is just with that same deep pour liquid glass epoxy. And the cool part about this is now you get a really good color pop. You really get to see that grain, that figure, and it's gonna look much, much better than this in the end, but it is pretty fun to see all that color come to life. I had initially assumed my client wanted three straight sides and one live edge side. And then when he saw the slab, he said, oh no, I love that other live edge corner. Can we keep that on there? And I'm kind of a yes man. So I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, we can do that. But I didn't really know how I was gonna fill this crack because that live edge kind of flowed down over into it. So I had to get really creative with this whole process. And you'll see what was so tricky about it once I start the filling process. But all I did to start was add some melamine, caulk it under every side, anywhere I could think of, and now here is my secret weapon. And I've mentioned this before in videos, but I use the tabletop epoxy. I warm it up to make it extra thin. You just use like 100 degree water or something, kind of a nice warm bath there. Mix it up and then I pour that in there. And that is gonna be kind of my insurance policy where it's gonna seep in and fill in any of the little micro cracks that I might've missed with that caulk. This crack was right on the edge of being big enough for the deep pour epoxy or small enough for a tabletop epoxy. And in the end, I decided to use the deep pour epoxy. I'm glad I did. It was about two and a half inches thick or so, and it would have been a lot of pores to use the tabletop epoxy. And I do get a better result on these deeper ones with this deep pour epoxy. You'll see some of the problems I ran into here was look at how there's not like a firm wall. And if I fill that crack all the way up, it's gonna spill down the side and run all over my floor. So I came up with this little foam piece and it doesn't look like it works here, but it actually worked really well. Okay, it worked okay. I wouldn't say really well, but I used that as a dam, was able to fill the crack all the way up and it did leak a little bit out. You'll see me break it off here, but in the end I was actually pretty pleased with the whole process. All right, that wasn't my most elegant epoxy pour, but in the end, I accomplished what I needed to accomplish, so we will just call that a win. Now I was ready to take it back into creative woodworking and bring it to its final thickness using their planer slash wide belt sander. And 
Fun fact, I've been coming here for years and I do this awkward kind of offloading of the slab when I move it over to the cart. And Thor, who is the guy who usually helps me, finally showed me right there, hey, here, let me show you how to load this. And I'm like, okay. And look how slick this is. Man, that is a lot better and I'm pretty embarrassed it took me five years to get there. But this is what we're looking at. This is pretty incredible. This Bastone Walnut with all kinds of curl is in the home stretch now. People always ask me if I'm a self-taught woodworker and I don't really believe that's a thing. I think unless you're like the kid from the Blue Lagoon, you basically learned it from somewhere. I learned everything I know from online tutorials and just trial and error. Since online tutorials worked for my woodworking, I decided to use Skillshare to up my filmmaking game. Not filmmaking, my YouTube, my YouTube content creation. I'm using Skillshare to make my videos better. I've talked about it a little bit in the past, but I shot my first 90 or so YouTube videos with just my iPhone, and my last three videos I've shot with my new fancy mirrorless camera. Since you're watching this video, there's a good chance you're one of the several dozen comments I got from people on my very first video I shot with a new camera about how bad the audio was. It was horrible. People said they had it turned all the way up and they couldn't even hear it. I know that Skillshare has literally thousands of courses, so I got in there and I just searched audio editing DaVinci Resolve, and I wasn't sure what would come up, and sure enough, there's a full course by an industry professional, someone that actually does this for a living, specifically on editing audio in DaVinci Resolve, the software that I use. The course I found is about 55 minutes long, and so far I'm only about halfway through it, so hopefully this audio is sounding a little bit better than that first video. There's also a full YouTube course that includes video editing by Marquez Brownlee that I'm really excited to check out because he apparently looks like he knows what he's doing. Best of all, unlike my videos, there are no ads in Skillshare, and there are new premium classes being added all the time. Topics ranging from woodworking to web development to YouTubing. If you have the time and you want to show some support for my page, I would really appreciate it if you click that link in the description below. The first thousand of my subscribers that click that link will get a one month trial of Skillshare absolutely free. All right, if you're wondering what you missed there, I filled some holes with epoxy and now I am ready to recess the table legs. If you're wondering, these table legs are by a company called Flowy Line Design. They are really cool, a really contemporary design, and they are even handmade. They're not gonna be for everybody. If they are something you wanna check out, I will leave a link to these in the description below, along with a link to everything else that I use here, those funny looking chisel, the router I have there, everything will be linked in the description below. As much fun as I have crushing myself with giant tables, I really like these more one man sized tables. They are fun to work on because when I need to do something like this, I can do it by myself and I don't have to worry about crushing myself with an oversized slab. Here you can see the overspill of the pour and how I'm cleaning it up. I'm using the Cutsaw Fine Ball Nose Burr and I just removed most of the epoxy. I was making sure to wear a respirator. The stuff is kind of nasty when it's airborne. And after this, I moved on to my Dremel with a little bit of sandpaper, just so it doesn't look so much like a Exxon Valdez spilled down the side of the table, make it a little bit more finished. A couple of years ago, I had made a few no talking woodworking videos and one of them even did pretty well and I hadn't done it in a while. So I thought it would be fun to do a no talking kind of ASMR video on this bow tie inlay that you see right here. So I made like a 15 minute video, no talking whatsoever, just woodworking sounds. And I also get a couple comments a week of people that tell me how much they hate the sound of my voice and how I should let the woodworking do the talking for me. So I thought this could be a good way to give that audience something that they want. What I didn't anticipate is all of the dozens and dozens and dozens of comments that I got from you guys that apparently actually want my commentary. It was bizarre and actually really flattering. So I decided I will not have any more no talking woodworking videos because for whatever reason, at least the vast majority of you guys actually wanna hear what I have to say. And I thought that was some great feedback most of the people were nice. A couple were really upset saying they were unsubscribing, which I guess is just the cost of operation. But if you want to check out that no talking version, I'll include a link in the video description below. And I am still going to make a commentary version of that detailed bow tie inlay in probably the next couple weeks. Anytime I do one of these bow tie inlays in a video, I get a lot of questions ranging from what do they do? Are they just for looks? Do they actually hold the crack together? Is epoxy better than a bow tie? Is a bow tie better than epoxy? Why would you ruin a beautiful slab of wood with those hideous bow ties? All kinds of great questions. And the answer a lot of times is the same as basically anytime my wife asks me something, which is, I, I have no idea. And that's really true is a lot of times I'm guessing and here I believe the epoxy was enough to keep that crack closed. But right here, 
is one that I didn't think it was gonna be enough because it was such a small crack and it actually went all the way through the slab that I actually added these bow ties on the underside because I didn't think they looked very good, whereas I actually liked the look of the other ones. These ones I didn't think looked great, but they were gonna be very structural because that epoxy really wasn't penetrating and the fact that that crack went all the way through the slab, I would sleep a lot better if I added some bow ties in this particular crack. As the slab sits right now, it's about 76 inches left to right and around 32 inches front to back. And a few weeks ago, or maybe a month or two ago, I started adding in the metric numbers in the captions because I have a number of international viewers and a few of them asked and said, hey, this would be really helpful if you could add the metric numbers to make it easier for us. And so I said, yeah, absolutely, no problem. However, whenever I do that, I always get the international viewer that likes to pile on and tell me how us Americans are so stupid. So I wanted to address that really quick if I can. And first of all, yes, we are using the wrong system. The metric system makes way more sense. However, everybody I know uses this system. They use the wrong system. The hardware store uses the wrong system. All the tools use the wrong system. All of my clients use the wrong system. So I really am not big enough to change the system from within. It's kind of like, I think it was in the 1700s, the French came out with a 10 hour clock for a 10 hour day where it was a 100 minutes in an hour and 100 seconds in a minute and everything was gonna make way more sense. The problem was everybody already had clocks, everybody already had their watches or pocket watches, whatever they carried back then and nobody would adopt it because they didn't wanna change. And I think that a 10 hour day makes way more sense than a 24 hour day, but people are already used to one thing and so it never took off. And that's really the system that I'm in right now. I know other countries have changed in the past. If you know Americans at all, we are way too stubborn to change at this point. So I hope you can understand the position that I'm in. When I first got this slab surfaced, it looked so clean that I thought I'd be able to cut this up for instrument grade projects if I had wanted to. I could, you know, use it for guitar blanks or gun stocks or things like that. After I got a little bit further into it, I realized that there were far too many little imperfections that I think those OCD guys that build guitars this one probably wouldn't have passed muster. And for a desk, it was totally fine, but all that meant for me was I had to spend a lot more time than I'd anticipated filling all these imperfections, sanding it perfectly, and just keeping a sharp eye out for all of these little micro cracks. And if you're looking for a great tool to spot these imperfections, this is called a light stick. And one of my YouTube subscribers here actually recommended it in a comment, he's a photographer, and this was only like $45 or so, but it does an amazing job at spotting all of those little micro imperfections. I mentioned at the start of the video that I'm using an all new finish and I'm still going to be using my normal finish for the base coat, but what's gonna be the new finish is going to be for the final, really two top coats. And I'll get into that here in just a minute. Also, if I didn't mention it, I have timestamps down below that show every single chapter. So if you wanna skip around, if you wanna come back to an area, or if you just really don't like a certain part, feel free to skip around using those timestamps. I mentioned in each video that I finish both sides immediately, meaning I finish the bottom and while it's still wet, I flip it over and then I'll finish the top. Often I'll get the question, don't you get marks on the underside of your table if you flip it over while it's still wet? And yes, I absolutely do get marks. Here is my solution to that. This is the following day. I come back with that maroon pad, scuff it up nice and even, then I'll add a second coat of this Rubio Monocoat. This time I will not flip it. I'll let it set overnight, let it cure. The following day I'll come over, flip the slab and do the same thing on the top. If you do some woodworking and you wanna get a perfect finish in a dusty shop and you think that I just went way too fast over that entire finishing process and you need a deeper dive into that, first off, I totally agree with you. I do not expect you to understand everything I just did based on that brief summary. I did a full finish video oh, six or eight months ago. I will include a link to that that gives a step-by-step -step guide, including all the tools you need, all of the consumables you need, everything to get a perfect finish in a dusty shop. I still have a couple really cool things to show you on this desk build. However, I don't want your charity, but if you think up to this point that I've earned your subscription, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button right now. And you want to hit the like button, that's cool too. And if you're one of those people that hates people that ask for subscriptions and likes, and you're gonna give me a thumbs down because of it, I have to warn you that YouTube actually considers that a positive. YouTube actually considers thumbs down, thumbs up, comments, shares, everything is engagement. So 
If you're gonna leave me a negative comment and a negative thumbs down, those actually help me. So do yourself a favor and don't do either of those things if you actually dislike this video. If you do like the video, as always, I really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button and like button or really any of them. Over the last few months, I've gotten a lot of questions from people asking me what I thought of the Black Forest ceramic finish. And initially I was a little embarrassed because I had never heard of it. And really it seemed like kind of something you'd find on an infomercial, something that that ShamWow guy would be buffing into a car sitting in a junkyard. So I was a little skeptical. So I did more and more research on the ceramic coat kind of finish in general, how they use it on cars and it seemed pretty legit. So even though I'm friendly with the Black Forest guys, I used my own money and I purchased this myself. So that way there was no expectations or obligations on my part. I tested the finish initially on a number of small pieces and it did pretty well. So I decided the first real test for it was gonna be on my personal dining room table that I recently built. And if you watched that video, you didn't see the Black Forest ceramic in there because I added it after the fact. And we've been living with that table for about a month or so now with the Black Forest ceramic on it, and it has performed extraordinarily well. We have had our multiple family dinners and I had to bite my tongue. People were using their icy glasses with no coasters and I decided I just had to, to see how this table was gonna perform without me babing it. And there is no cup rings, there are no stains, there are no marks on the table still to this point. One of the really unexpected benefits to it is the porcelain plates seem to kind of glide across it. It's kind of like a wax where they glide so smoothly that they don't scuff up the table. So I thought that was really cool. And also like you saw there, it really steps the sheen up, steps the depth up. It's kind of like an Instagram filter where it just turns the contrast up of all of your table, all of the grain, all of the figuring. So I am thrilled with it. It's not foolproof. It's not something that you can just put it on and forget about it. But if you're gonna take care of your stuff, this is really, really gonna help and it's gonna really improve the look of it too. I didn't wanna make this a how-to video on how to apply the Black Forest Ceramic because I do feel that they have a better video and I'm still pretty new to this. I've only put this on a few tables up to this point. And it is really, really easy. Essentially, you just add the base coat in those grids. You add a little bit, just a spritz of water to the microfiber. You wipe it off either with your hand or an orbital like I was using. And that is basically it. You can come back, then I believe they want you to wait about an hour for the top coat, and you do the exact same thing. You just work it on in grids, buff it off lightly. You're not really putting any pressure down, just lightly removing any excess. Finish up your table, and that is it. It is really, really simple. There are no lap lines. That is something I was really concerned about. I was sure there would be lap lines from the different sections that I buffed it on, but that's it, and it genuinely, genuinely helps the protection and really, really stepped up that sheen and contrast. Oh, I almost forgot to get the numbers in. The cost of this raw wood slab was $2,500, and the cost of this finished desk was $9,900. I know that a lot of times you guys are generally pretty curious about the numbers, so I hope that helps out some of you guys. And also, I like to give a little bit of credit to people that make it all the way to the end of the video. So let me know your thoughts on the bow ties. Start your comment with either bow tie or no tie to let me know how you feel about those. As always, thank you so much for watching. Have a great week.